Donna Haraway, the author of Cyborg Manifesto, she wrote this idea about non-human allies, that you had interspecies friendships, and that dogs and animals, but also cell phones, would be your non-human ally. And again, we don't expect a dog to act like a human, so why are we expecting AI to act like a human too? It's, it's fundamentally its own thing. Let's maximize what that is. Whatever weird species it is, it's cool, but let's work with it and see what happens. Hello all, I'm Chris Beasley coming to you from Sunny Dog Patch in San Francisco, California. This is the Hacker Noon Podcast. Today, Harvard Berkman and MIT Media Lab fellow Amber Case talks about building technology which augments our human abilities. This is part interview, part conversation between friends. Amber and I are two of the co-founders of the Indie Web movement, which moves social connections off of private platforms like Facebook onto federated websites that users own. I've had the great pleasure of witnessing her do extraordinary things like be honored as a National Geographic Emerging Explorer and authoring two books for O'Reilly, Calm Technology, and the one that just came out this January, Designing with Sound. Over the past decade of knowing each other, we've shaped each other's companies and lives in profound ways. She's simply one of the most endlessly fascinating and unexpected people I know. I'm delighted to share our conversation with you today. Sunday Night Blues creeping in every week. It's time to find a job you love. Indeed Prime connects tech talent to software, DevOps, and other knowledge worker roles with leading companies like eBay, Barclays, Vodafone, HomeAway, and more across 90 cities. Whether you're looking or hiring, get the right match for you based on location, skills, and salary. Candidates join totally free and also get access to resume reviews, one-on-ones with technical career coaches, work style assessments, and negotiation tips to seal the deal. Join now at IndeedPrime.com slash Hacker Noon to flip the script on the job search. That's Indeed, P-R-I-M-E dot com slash Hacker Noon. Amber Case, welcome to Hacker Noon. Thanks, it's great to be here. So I wanted to start off by talking about this We Are All Cyborgs Now, which was the talk of your TED the title of your TED Talk from several years ago, but it really encapsulates your background in sociology and anthropology combined with um, your futurist and technology angle. Yeah, um, this was when I was in college. Actually, before college, I came from a technical family, but like blue collar tech. So my parents were broadcast engineers, they put TV on the air, and I grew up with an Atari as if it were the family dog. So I got to hang out with the computer. I had a tape recorder. When it died and I couldn't repair it, I gave it a burial in the backyard. So I was pretty computer oriented and really into math and science and engineering. And then I kind of burnt myself out trying to go to Caltech or MIT, and I wasn't exactly sure I had a job offer at like a big engineering firm. I didn't need a college degree, so I called my mom's best friend up and I said, what's going on? You know, what, what should I be doing with my life? And she said, look, you need to learn how to think. You shouldn't major in math or science or engineering. You should go to a private liberal arts college, learn how to think, do, you know, major in the thing that you're the worst at. And I said, oh no, that's social studies. <laughs> so I went, I registered as a sociology anthropology major within like five days. I just took all these random classes to see what I liked and it hit home, it was great. Um, and then I learned about all of these people in anthropology like Lucy Sudgman, who was an anthropologist working with Xerox Park in the 70s and 80s and understood that most people didn't want to just use the printer all the time. They just wanted to make a copy. So that's where the big green copy button came from. And you could have hired 10,000, 20,000 engineers to try to figure that out, or you could have just hired one anthropologist or a single artist that could have had that different perspective. We talk about diversity, but diversity also includes social classes and backgrounds. If we talk about Stuart Butterfield, he has a degree in philosophy, he made Slack, he made Flickr, he made Game Never Ending, the kind of the predecessor, he made Glitch. He was trying to make these things in different ways. The guy who made the 3M post-it note is a, is a banjo player. <laughs> you know, it, it, so it's, it's always these different angles. And I've noticed that in the past, we've had so many people 
being, well, especially in the upper class, you would learn everything. You could sketch, and you could be a scientist, and you could be a poet. And now we're expected to specialize in one specific thing that lasts for a couple years, and then we have to change the programming language because it's not cool anymore. So when I was in college, end of freshman year, I found out that there was this field called cyborg anthropology, and that it was kind of merging my love of technology and my difficult understanding of people, and that there might be an opportunity there to make better things for people. Um, when I was writing my thesis later on mobile phones, right in 2007 when the iPhone came out, I noticed that there was this idea of calm technology that also came out of Xerox PARC. As, as, most, as most of us know, a lot came out of Xerox PARC, like Ethernet, the graphic user interface. It was so successful because it hired artists, anthropologists, and technologists. And that commingling of these different people from different backgrounds gave us a lot of what we use today. But I thought there might be some innovations that didn't come out of park, that we didn't see, that were kind of lost to time. And so I started digging, and I found this calm technology idea from Mark Weiser, John Seeley Brown. And it was kind of like a, a technology universal. We talk about human universals, the idea of wanting to belong or wanting food mm -hmm. and water. But these technology universals, you could read this paper in any era, the series of papers, and they would make perfect sense. It didn't seem like, oh, we can't catch up with tech. It was, here's some universals so that we can make tech last for the long term. We need to remember that we grew up alongside our tools as humans and that these computers are still tools. And it's the relationship and the harmony of them working alongside us and enabling us, not being smarter than us and telling us what to do. We need to have smarter humans, not smarter technology. Yeah, I love the way that you think of the cyborg not as, not so much as the even, um, you know, nanobots that are in your bloodstream, although that's part of it, but you point out very rightly that we are already cyborgs. We are already um, outsourcing our memory to our our Google searches and whatnot. Um, what are some of the things that you've seen maybe in the last year or two that you love the most? Yeah, I, there's this little startup in Kyoto in Japan, and they have people who have learned traditional furniture woodworking working alongside programmers to make this thing called MUI, which is the idea of an empty container. It's a long piece of beautiful wood that you can install in your home, and it has just this minimal interface that's kind of white and pale underneath a very thin slice of wood. And that shows you the weather. You can record your kid's height on it and move and take it to the next house. There's like little things you can do. But it's so beautiful that even if it broke, and even if it didn't have its technological capability, you would still leave it in your home. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the most important things is, is to look at technology that fails well, that we know that all of it will fail, but how well does it fail? How does it degrade? There's even a word in Japanese for something that degrades and, and reminds us of humanity and how things change. Instead of having an object only for six months and then switching it out for a better one, I don't necessarily think our technology is getting better every single cycle. I think it's getting more complex, heavier, the software is larger and more bloated, and we say, oh, it's faster, but we actually need it to be faster to run all of the bloated applications that we have. So I was really inspired by video game revolution in the 80s because you had limitations, and that's why we got these clever sprites and all of these new programming methods because of the limitations. Right now, when we don't have these limitations and there's funding in very specific ways for very specific applications and methods, we risk forgetting just the history of some of these things, like the magic leap has been invented many times before, always raised a lot of money and has always failed. Um, and if we get like a landscape that's more than a couple of years and we think of the technology universals that don't really change for thousands of years, we can begin to understand whether something's going to fail or succeed or how to build technology better. Mm -hmm.
Sunday Night Blues creeping in every week. It's time to find a job you love. Indeed Prime connects tech talent to software, DevOps, and other knowledge worker roles with leading companies like eBay, Barclays, Vodafone, HomeAway, and more across 90 cities. Whether you're looking or hiring, get the right match for you based on location, skills, and salary. Candidates join totally free and also get access to resume reviews, one-on-ones with technical career coaches, work style assessments, and negotiation tips to seal the deal. Join now at IndeedPrime.com slash Hacker Noon to flip the script on the job search. That's Indeed, P-R-I-M-E dot com slash Hacker Noon. Beautiful. You wrote a really wonderful article about the problems of touchscreens and cars, and, and I completely agree. I think I would have a really hard time buying a 2019 model car because they just they just really offend me. I want buttons. I want a knob for the air conditioner. Is that too much to ask? I just want a knob for the air conditioner. Well, we were actually driving in your friend's car that's like an older model BMW. And I was noticing that there are no touch screens. I think it's a 90s car. and it, But the panels themselves, the lights at night are orange. Mm -hmm. And what we have to remember is that like Navy and military, which in submarines where people are staying at screens for incredibly long shifts, you don't want to make them blue. You can make them green or orange because that doesn't interfere with your night vision. Mm -hmm. And in a car, if you're constantly having to focus between a blue high energy screen plus all of the knobs and dials that are backlit blue and the road you're much less likely to be able to focus you're going to have more fatigue you're going to have ghosting on your eyes plus when we think of how attention works like we have a lot of primary attention high resolution primary attention in front of our face and that's usually what the car is helping us to do it's helping us to focus on that primary attention we glance to see whether there are cars around us sometimes we even turn around if we're unsure we use a foot pedal. We don't even have to look at the foot pedal to use the foot pedal. Sewing machines have foot pedals. The first mouse had a foot pedal. <laughs> what happened to the foot pedal? So there were all these different um, secondary and tertiary senses being used and, and we were able to be informed while having our primary attention on the road. When we have an iPad sitting there in the car or our direction system that's not at road height or not projected onto the window, which would be a good way to do it, you have this glanceability, but when you glance, you drop all of the variables in your primary attention for the variables in the screen on your car, and that becomes an issue, plus the night vision issue. So, you know, this, the story I wrote about that was that I noticed that touch screens, even though they might be ugly, used in food service, we had a sort of muscle memory on these very specific large format touch screens where you know where all the buttons are, they never change. Uh, but then you have the idea of somebody saying, well, we need to put an iPad in a car, let's do it. And me getting into a nice Mercedes Benz at a conference and <laughs> ranting to the guy next to me about how nobody touched the screen while they were driving, how nobody went through actual QA tests to see what it was like, that they did it just because people wanted it. And the guy next to me was like the chairman of the board of Mercedes and said, yeah, we didn't test it out. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, how, do we, how do we go back? And I think we have to think about grounded futurism. Like a grounded futures, first off, it's futures because there's not one future. We have simultaneous futures and pasts all over the place at the same time. You have 1920s um, agrarian society and 1800s agrarian society somewhere in the world right now working simultaneously alongside something in Shanghai that might be incredibly high tech. And so it's grounded in that we're not thinking automatically of the future being perfect corporate utopia where everything always works because we know that that's not true and neither is it complete dystopia where it's Terminator or Robocop. The idea that we're all cyborgs is that Terminator or Robocop that you know you don't have to be permanently attached to your device in order to be a cyborg. You can just use a tool. And so Grounded Futures is saying, let's actually look at what works in a car or not. What do people need? Wasn't the idea of a car to be some joyride escape that you would drive it up to like the hill and neck on the top of it, that you could get away from your parents for the first time, that um, the cars were subsidized and so was the oil, so you'd go on the big Sunday drive and like in the 70s they'd be the size of boats and you'd cruise around late at night, you know, meeting people. Like those old cars were cozy. You know, they were not meant to be driven in these like tiny little 
microaggressive interceptions that we have now. They're, you know, they were leisure cars. We had free time for them. We could also maintain them ourselves. So what happened? I mean, in, in, in all the systems, like we have Facebook where that's kind of replacing the original bulletin board system online. And in a bulletin board, you could leave, you could ban somebody, you could know people in the bulletin board well enough that like if somebody had a suicidal episode, you could help them out. You could also change your identity anytime you wanted. You didn't have to be this certain person. So there was no risk of being doxxed. And, and now we have the idea of like, does empathy and craft actually scale? Can we have everyone on Facebook actually be taken care of properly? Or are we having giant screens full of 50 accounts at a time that a content manager who gets paid 50K a year looks at and then chain smokes between all their breaks because they've seen a lot of nasty stuff. You know, as somebody who's known a bunch of them and gone into Ustream and Justin TV and hung out with their content people, their content moderators, the sheer number of difficult things they see per day could be reduced if everybody kind of ran a node of their own world. <laughs> and that's like, oh, how could people be responsible enough to run a node of their own world? But if it's your family and friends, like, right, you know, right. not saying that it was better, but we just don't have that many options anymore. We've been reduced to like a single templated cell phone most. And we forgot that the web was originally about making your own website. It was kind of silly, you know? Early on, you know, you and I and Tom Tech and Aaron kind of founded this indie web camp, <laughs> which was all about making your own home web page again. Um, you know, that's, that's become more of a W3C standards committee long-term planning type thing versus getting people to make their own web page. And I encourage people to go to like neocities.org, which is like the new version of GeoCities, and just remember what it's like to be silly again. And I'm wondering like, where is play going? Are kids actually playing or are they being rushed between extracurricular activities so that they can get, you know, some, some experience in for their college essay and then they have to do SAT prep? Like where are the people like slacking off for a couple of years in their parents' garage playing loud music and, and going on road trips and then understanding that it's okay to do that for 10 years and then having a life. You know, why are people jumping into the seriousness so, so quickly? Is this really what life is? Because it doesn't make sense at this point in time. You know, I think there needs to be a little bit more free time and, and boredom. Um, and just, I think in a society, you should be able to choose what level of tech you want to use. Like somebody who's 80 could choose to be super tech, high tech, and somebody who's 10 could be like, I don't want to use any tech at all. And that the society should function great for them no matter what. So you talked about the importance of play, which of course I completely agree with. And that seems like that's one of those um, fundamental human needs I just want to call back to something you mentioned earlier about what technology needs that's that's universal throughout time. Can you speak a little bit more about a few of those principles? Sure, sure. Well, some of the principles of Calm Tech are use the least amount of tech to get the job done. Every single new feature that you add will fail in some way. Um, gracefully degrade so that when it fails, it fails in different ways. Like. Let's say you can't load the three megabytes of JavaScript that you need to load before you see the content on Twitter. So it just knows that and it says, okay, well, we're just gonna load this two kilobyte string of text. So you can still get the content even if you're not in like the perfect condition. I think a lot of software is tested in perfect conditions with perfect Wi-Fi, the latest tech. What about trying it in a rural grocery store and you're trying to get the coupon app downloaded before you get to the checkout line? <laughs> Right, right. So that's one of the other ones. Another one is like be locally maintainable. We used to take our televisions down the street to get repaired. You go over to India and everything's being repaired on the street. And it's, it's, it's different, right? Like it's not that it's better, it's just it's different. There's more opportunities to, to participate in a local economy that way. And I think there's an empowering sense if you can fix your own car or fix your own computer and that you can have it for a long time. I think we're turning right now from products to services where people are like, okay, we're not buying the newest iPhone anymore. We're gonna buy an older one because it's good enough. And then it needs to be better each time. I wanna download an app and have it have less 
uh, less gigabytes at this point for um, for that app to run. You know, some of them are 300 megabytes. What's all this stuff in there? Like, is it is it necessary? And it's because we have all these frameworks on top of frameworks and all these abstractions on top of abstractions. And then WeChat comes out and we say, wow, why is that so popular? Or Instagram, it's like, well, Instagram deliberately degrades your photos by using filters to allow them to still look good while they can go over cell network. And that's what made it spread so well and it focused on one thing. And then with you know some of these really popular apps in like the Netherlands and things, people are still getting sports scores in all capital letters from a really old system that's been around since the 90s or 80s. And WeChat, WeChat is great because there's a limitation of bandwidth in China. It didn't it grow out of IRC, which is a really low bandwidth to begin with. So I want to go to the opposite always of whatever sine wave there is. And I want to say, you know, is everybody investing in Bitcoin and decentralization? Like, do the opposite. See what happens, you know. And I think we're on another AI boom where we are placing too many expectations in AI. And we've done this again in the... 60s and in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s and then it bursts and then we stop researching and I think the most important thing about AI is that there's no such thing as AI there's deep learning there's machine learning there's assistive technology AI is just this like term from science fiction again it's like at some point there's this perfection we need to say we're never going to get to perfection in anything and nature is only perfect because it's imperfect inherently and then from here, we need to figure out how well we can make something knowing that there's a flaw and make that harmonious and focus on the best of what humans can do and the best of what computers can do. You know, humans can drive cars pretty well unless they're drunk. <laughs> uh, and, you know, but also humans are, you know, they're pretty good at telling you or fixing the ticket machine for you or just giving you a ticket at, at the subway station because the ticket machine stopped working. Um, I also think about it like Donna Haraway, one of the founders of, well, one of the authors, well, the author of Cyborg Manifesto, she wrote this idea about non-human allies, that you had interspecies friendships, and that dogs and animals, but also cell phones, would be your non-human ally. And again, we don't expect a dog to act like a human, so why are we expecting AI to act like a human too? This is non-human. It's, it's fundamentally its own thing. Let's maximize what that is. Whatever weird species it is, it's cool, but let's work with it and see what happens. And stop trying to make these things that are like, oh, here's, here's a, a woman-shaped bot, robot, and she's been given more rights than most of the women in the world. <laughs> like, okay, no, no, no. You know, and it's made by a guy, so then like, is the bot male or female? Like, why are we ascribing these characteristics anyway? It doesn't matter. You know, it's kind of like being like, oh, well, a dog is only cool. Or, you know, this dog is female or male. So, well, okay. You know, they go into heat a little bit, but, like, it's a, it's a whole different thing. It's a whole different species. Right, um, right. It's not the same thing. So we kind of have to look at how, how these things change um, and make sure that, like, we aren't just going down these things. And then, and then also looking at, like, what happened in the 60s. Like, the first psychologist chatbot, one of the earliest chatbots, Eliza, was created because this psychologist, this, or this psychiatrist said, sure, you can replace my job with a robot, let me do it, and put in the most basic, boring questions into that bot to have people answer it. And it turned out like, how do you feel about that? What do you, you know, how are your mother and father? Tell me about this. And he found that his secretary loved it, and she would hang out talking to Eliza for hours on end. And he was asking why, and she said, look, this doesn't judge like a therapist might. And really, it's not about the bot being smart. It's about it getting you to get in a conversation and a feedback loop with yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that we're missing is that we miss feedback loops. Like, we, we got the idea of everything's just gonna improve, and we're gonna have everything machine or everything human, and it's this dichotomy. It's like, no, no, no. Like, listen to Gary Kasparov, like the, the chess champion that talked about centaurs, that a mediocre chess player with a good system can outperform um, either an expert chess player or an expert system. That it's really this intersection between the best of humans and the best of, of computers or automation or technology that allows us to do things that are interesting. Just think of musical instruments. I mean, those are incredibly complex, and here they are, decorative, timeless, 
working with the air in our lungs to produce different sounds, and we're the ones pressing the buttons. How amazing is that? And yet we don't regard that as technology. That is technology, and that's technology at human scale. And I think, you know, what are cities at human scale? What's technology at human scale? Regardless of politics, it's about being able to run your own business or being able to walk to the grocery store. It's about a cheaper city because you're not maintaining all of these roads. Um, you have the essentials, but then you have local food. Remember when you used to go around the world and not everyone was wearing the same Adidas shoes? You would go for the weirdness, <laughs> like everything was different. Now I, I you know, I, I travel around the world, travel to like 12 to 15 countries a year and I have for like at least five or six years. Um, I'm seeing things so similar, mm -hmm. you know? And I think maybe finally there's this idea of cosmotechnics where what would it really look like if Argentina made their technology not just use Microsoft Word? What would Argentinian Microsoft Word look like? Would we even have one? Right, and right. what does Japanese technology look like? We know that. We know that there is an excitement about automation, not because, ooh, it's automation. It's because there's a really, really increasing aging population and they have to turn to automation. And then woven into the culture, there's an idea of human computer harmony and the idea of things being polite and things being a collective. And so you have technology that behaves well and humans that behave well as well, according to certain cultural codes. So up until very recently, people still had their Japanese flip phones. Like in 2014, there were still television programs about people trying to be like, hey, I'm gonna switch out of this telephone. Um, for the new smartphone, and then I went um, uh, last month to Japan to see, and there it was. Everything was iPads and iPhones. Mm. And I felt really sad in a way. You know, I use a Japanese camera, a Sony camera. It's really, it's like using my childhood camera. It's always been the same. You know, you plan 50 years of time there. But it was weird to see that, like, something that was created in Silicon Valley is now considered the default of how you interact with digital. I went to a large outsourcing company in India and I said, what would your technology look like? You're getting hired to make American technology. What if you took the last 5,000 or so years of your culture and what would that look like? How would it interact? Do we even, can we even consider this? You know, the only thing we have is what? Cuba, China, Japan. We have a little bit of Dutch. Like we have, you know, kind of on the broader global landscape of recognition, you know, not that there isn't stuff everywhere, but think about how the Mongolians made tools to work with the geographies and ate food in alignment with those geographies. What would digital look like, or is it even necessary? It certainly wouldn't look like the the Google and the Apple, you know, material very flat. We, got, we decided that buttons didn't have shadows anymore, and that they went from I don't know what month of what year it was that we decided that buttons should have square corners again instead of round corners, but everybody changed at the same time, uh, or in a very short order. Yeah, because it's like the new modern, like we got stuck with the mouse forever, not because the mouse was the best way to interact with technology, but because it was good enough and it was it became a persistent architecture. So yeah, I think there's this, this idea that computing should be flat, everything should be a clamshell, you open and close, that's not even at the right level for our heads. Like we should be sitting right, up like right. this to get the right blood flow. So instead, like I've done these different experiments and I've done screen recordings of what I do on my phone versus my laptop versus my standing desk with like an external monitor and my computing is completely different. Mm -hmm. I binge and I get depressed on my phone. I do online shopping and answer emails sometimes on my main computer. I do all of the like thoughtful work and creative work on the desktop. And it's different for everybody, but it's an issue that I found is that what happened to, you know, why do we scroll infinitely now? Right, right. You know, and and also we're consuming more than we create. And uh, there's this therapy that's like rapid left eye, left right eye therapy. Or like if you go into a yeah. fort, yeah, that. What is EMDR. it called? EMDR. Can you explain it? Because it's, it's cool. <laughs> sure. EMDR, um, I believe, stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. 
we can put the actual name in the show notes. Um, but if you just Google EMDR, you won't remember what it stands for either, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but it's essentially the practitioner does this and they ask you to follow their finger and it's about this fast uh, if you're watching the video. And uh, that process allows you to go into difficult memories um, without getting overwhelmed by them. And it, the mechanism is not entirely understood, but one of the hypotheses of how it works is um, the left-right bilateral motion is just a way of keeping you in the present moment, bringing you into your body and noticing that you have eyeballs and that they're capable of following your attention. Um, and it sort of is a distraction so that you can deal with the uncomfortable thoughts and sensations that are coming up while you have this sort of distraction of looking at your silly therapist's finger moving left and right. But it, it's actually quite effective. Cool. Yeah, I was, I was being told about this and one of the stories was that this person was walking through the park and suddenly felt a lot better. And they'd been going through like a lot of anxiety and loops. So they walked through the park, they felt better, and they're like, why did I feel better? They retraced their steps and said, oh, my eyes were moving left and right, looking at things. Mm -hmm. So now we have these phones and you're looking up and down. And so, but when you read a book or especially a newspaper, you're looking like right and left a lot. Like there's mm -hmm. this landscape that you're looking at. And so I'm wondering just the eye motions and the neck posture and things are changing how people are processing and it's difficult. I wonder if everybody inherently wants to create or wants to be a kid or wants to be their childlike self. And I think, you know, the idea of being a kid has a bad rap. It's like, oh no, millennials, da, da, da. And it's like, no, 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 millennials are not kids. Kids don't have the anxiety. Right. Um, you know, the idea of being a kid is saying, ooh, what if I did this? You know, what does that look like? They explore, you know, they're not middle management. Make sit in the front yard and make mud pies wearing your red sequin dance tutu costume because you were never, nobody ever made you realize when you were five that you were not supposed to wear your dance sequin costume when you were in the front yard making mud pies. <laughs> right. But then suddenly, like Richard Feynman did when he was just playing with frisbees and letting everything go, you know, he understood that, like, what about the relationship between how the center of the frisbee rotates and the outside? And then he ended up making physics work that, that granted him the Nobel Prize. And there's so much of this. I mean, um, we know from a ton of great research about flow states by Mihaly Shiz... <laughs> I can't put that on the show notes, too. Um, his amazing book about flow states shows a ton of research that's been done about how much more um, we're able to learn in flow states and how much more we're able to make those really critical leaps. That moment, there was a moment before E equals MC squared, and then there was the moment where it popped into Einstein's mind, and he was brilliant at using his violin playing breaks to allow those insights to arise because he just, he's a scientist, he's just observed what conditions am I in when I get my best work done? And I think that's what you're doing as well in looking at what happens when you're crunched up looking at the tiny phone screen versus at a standing desk. Yeah, yeah. And it becomes really important to not have this idea of what child what it's like or what play is like and understand like I would I would encourage everybody to go back and all of their triumphant moments or where they came up with their ideas and think about what kind of state of mind they were in and remember that like going and clicking a button and getting an uber eats because you are working really really hard <laughs> is different than being efficient at your work and coming up with it by taking a walk then going to a piece of paper writing it down and then using as a, a computer as a tool to render it I know that a lot of programmers, programming time is like three to four hours where you get the system in your head and you can work with it. And then a manager comes in on their 15 minute at a time management time and interrupts it. And so much of what I've noticed programming is, is all in your head. It's not sitting there with a computer. Like, yeah, you've got to Google stuff, copy and paste all over the place. Like that's what a lot of people do, you know, but from understanding the fundamentals, you can sit there and think like Steve Wozniak did because he wanted a really, really cheap computer. He couldn't afford one. He kept thinking, how do I take away 
chips and less until I have the most basic thing. And then from there, gave it color by adding one more chip. You know, it, the whole thing was just sitting there in his mind before he went to sleep, and he was playing around. And I think that's really important that, like, people don't need to be geniuses. We always find it funny. We make fun of people if they're weird. And then if they've done something important, they've institutionalized that weirdness. Now it's a genius, and now they can be as quirky as they want. Oh, well, yeah, like- what, about, what about allowing people to be individual quirks without being like, well, you can only be quirky in this way, and it's called Burning Man, so make sure you wear this tutu on this day. Schedule it for this one week per year. Yeah, like, get it all out like Halloween, you know, no, 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 or, or you're going to have the Burning Man lifestyle 24-7, like, yeah, but what about the, the original burners, like, how silly they were, how improvisational they were, you know, when I went, I was hanging out with with the, trying to find the original silly people where it wasn't about the aesthetics of what it looked like to do a tango dance naked. You know, it was about being goofy. You know, I found and robbed a convenience store on the playa because there was a convenience store and, and, I, and I robbed it wow. by using a Snickers bar as a gun. And then <laughs> I and then I got five dollars of play money out of the cash register and then I, I, I took off my mask, walked back in, and used the money to pay for an item. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's no money in the play. How was I going to get anything from the store? You know, so I had, to, I had to rob the store to get the fake money, to, right? But that kind of situation is, oh, you're in an art experiment. You can do anything you want. And... I think as an adult, you think, oh, well, I must program this way and I must sit here and I must do these things and programming happens on a computer and like my thoughts happen in front of a screen and yeah, yeah. we forget how the internet is kind of like this enormous paleontological site where there's so much dust accreting all the time that we get the, you know, we get on most, at most maybe the last two days of the web, whenever we dip into the popular sites, we get Facebook and Twitter and Reddit and Hacker News and some other news. But diving deeper, like even six months is hard to find a website that the content on that page has been around for that long. Or, you know, I go on archive.org all the time and I say, you know, this is just a temporary period of time that we're in. It always changes, it's always different. Why are people thinking it's permanent? You know, it, it just look back 10 years. I mean, we just got the iPhone like a little more than 10 years ago. We got social media, like, Mm -hmm. before that. What does that mean, you know? And and then in history. So for me, I just want to be calm when I think about the future. And I work at this place called the Institute for the Future Now, uh, which has a 50-year model that kind of came out of Stanford Research Institute. This this has been around for 50 years. They have an 80% success rate at predicting the future. It's a nonprofit, and these tools to kind of understand the future is that you look at signals, you don't look at trends. And that's really important because the trend leads you astray. You think, oh, that's a real thing. It's like, no, 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 no. A signal is something that, even if it doesn't work, like a signal would be pets.com in the 2000s. Mm-hmm. It's not that it's going to be successful, but that model at some point has, has legs because it keeps coming up. Mm-hmm. Then when it goes away, it's like, well, the next person that makes a pets.com will probably get it bought by Amazon or some big thing. That, that these are this model. So you kind of see these echoes of the future early, and then you can kind of capture them. And then you can start to either create the future, influence the future, or kind of see what's going to happen. And it's not as mystifying and terrifying as it sounds, you know? It's still complicated, but to think about it, I talk with people, how long does it take to come up with one of these signals? And so you just relax your brain and walk around and think about stuff, other stuff, and then it'll hit you. And you say, oh, that's a signal, cool. Like, you don't just go out on journeys and hunt for signals. Like, you live, and then you get the signal. And then you think about for a week how to write it up. It's incredible. It's it's this really slow work that is meaningful and honest. And it's a big honor to be able to learn something that's slow and relaxing while also incredibly challenging. Yeah, I, I had the pleasure of being at their conference that was on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Probably not last year, the year before that, I think Jane McGonigal was speaking, and I love the way they, the word that's coming to mind is accrete. 
You know, this is not a process where we want to pop out and inside. It's more like we're centering layer by layer <laughs> all of these different observations about culture and sociology and anthropology and material science, like what's just now becoming possible that's never been possible before. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if, as you collaborate there, if you notice anything different about the form or the social dynamics that makes that sort of accretion possible in a way that you haven't seen before. Yeah, it's not a bunch of people in a conference room being like, let's make these decisions. It's people, you don't necessarily, like I, I was on one of these calls about the future, we're doing a future 50 conference because it's the 50th year. So it's a big deal, big auspicious number of being around for that long. And then we're talking about the future of power. So one of these calls is like two and a half hours. I, it, it's a lot of it's done remotely. We're on a Zoom meeting. We can see like little squares of each other. People are smiling, and we just play for two and a half hours. Throw around ideas. No one has an ego. No one takes credit for any of it. And went, ooh, that's interesting. What about this? Huh? That's interesting. What about this? It's never. Oh, that's dumb. We just try to get all the ideas. It's that method of just getting all the ideas out. And then later you can start to coalesce them. And I haven't seen that process yet, so I don't know what it's like. But, <laughs> um, you know, and I think it really takes, it could take a lifetime to learn that, which I also like, it's unmasterable. But because of that, everybody is humble. Everybody comes from weird backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like sometimes we're the only like heads up people in Palo Alto when we walk around because everybody mm -hmm. is like thinking about the next VC meeting or they are a VC and they're trying to figure out you know, and they're talking about almost the same topics, you know, and, and as somebody who raised money in Silicon Valley, I was one of those people, heads down, looking towards the next funding round, pitching people in Koopa Cafe, like, I was that person, you know, but now it's like I'm looking for the larger signals of things, and it's a much more encompassing, holistic mental model that's just really pleasant to just let my mind a lot, uh, just really relax, and then let the stuff come in and then be in a Brazilian enough state to write it down <laughs> and think about it. And then, you know, the work is hard to put it together because you can't force it. And I think for a lot of people that have a process where they say, it must be this way and at this time, you know, it's like, well, the deadlines just can't be that fast. And so you end up having much more quality work, you know, and there are a lot of executives from all over the world that come in and learn foresight training and have us as a client, <laughs> but, you know, and we're giving them these 10 year personalized forecasts and, you know, the, the, the Institute doesn't draw a lot of its uh, attention to itself for a reason. You know, there are a lot of futurists out there who are like, I'm a futurist, I'll tell you the future. And I'm like, well, if you are, then you should probably have made a, like a killing on the stock market. <laughs> like, if you really know the future and you've been a futurist for 30 years, like, like I don't know. I mean, I, I saw one futurist that's just, like, advising all these governments, and he's like, it's a blockchain, AI, da-da-da. I'm like, that's great. That's what they pay you to hear that. But you're not actually, you're talking about trends and not signals. So you're not able to get the contours of the changes that are happening you're just seeing these like random water droplets or like movements beneath the surface and you're just seeing the, the, the little pinpoint where it intersects the surface. And that's not calming. It's making people panic that they aren't going to keep up and then charging them for it. And I think it's really important to think about how we don't need to, to panic to keep up. If we understand a technology universal, that things will fail, just have them fail gracefully then we create these systems like in Japan where if your ticket doesn't work, there's a human. There's even a human that can like come out of the side of the ticket machine, <laughs> this little window. Um, or if it has to be completely automated and it's late at night, you can always just put your Japan Rail Pass or your ticket in a little camera and somebody can like look at it, examine it, and let you through. And they can do that remotely. So there's a lot of different ways to participate in that society and, and automation levels. That you know no matter what, when it fails, it is as smooth as it was if it was successful. <laughs> and that takes a lot of thought, and it's not fast work. And then also if you try to panic and do everything so fast, and we're going to make the Uber of blah, 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 it's like, okay, 
why are you trying to do that? You have all this intelligence and you're not trying to make microbes that eat plastic. You know, not to say that that's inherently a good thing morally, but that actually can make money. <laughs> You know, like some of these big universal classic products, like anything Philips Technology did, or like making a quieter blender, which would no one would think of because it's mundane. Like Jamba Juice buys thousand dollar blenders, like five or six of them. You make that blender and you have a market. It's a legitimate item that will probably be around for 10 years. So do you want to make something that's a flash in the pan so you get aqua hired and you're stuck in a company for four years while your investors got all of the money and you have an earnout and a failing stock because you don't really believe in the company, it doesn't with you, and then all your family think you're wealthy but you actually aren't and you want to leave and you leave before your vesting period is over and then you go <laughs> and you make another st startup that's the same. Or do you want to have like a family business, not lifestyle company, like <laughs> You don't need to surf all the time, like, that's great, you can, but how about something where you don't have to work a lot of hours of the week, yet you're providing this high quality service, and you're doing it because you've thought about it so well that it doesn't fail in the ways that things typically fail. Like, everything's already been hacked. Your information's already been compromised. Probably everybody in the world at this point. So. Maybe we shouldn't have Internet of Things home devices that run on an external network. Maybe you should have your own server. You should cache information to that and it doesn't come out. Like there's no two way, kind of like industrial IoT. There's these different models, like thinking in models and methods and like processes instead of here is the object. I must make a startup because that makes me look cool. This one woman was like, I want to get into tech. And I'm like, great, why do you want to get into tech? She's like, well, it's a great place to make money. And I was like, go become an investment maker on Wall Street. <laughs> make more money. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to um, Do you want to really work 90 hours a week and second guess yourself the entire time because the code that you're trying to fix or write was inherently flawed because it was written so quickly? Like, do you, do you, like, why? You know, oh, it's the money. Well, there's plenty of ways to make money. But like, you know, I got into it because I was rejected as a kid and I didn't have a choice. It was the only thing I could do that was empowering, that and writing comics. So for me, being online was freeing. You know, making websites was freedom. Um, and it's different for, every, for everybody. But for this person who was like, I want to learn how to code because it makes money, it's like, wait, are you even interested in how things work? Like, have you had any, like, I think there's a lot of depression because we, we can't even see things in depth anymore. It's so surface level. And there's a lot of work that we'll have to do. It's always funny. Oh, we don't need ethics anymore. We're all ethical now. You have to add it back into the curriculum now. It's like, oh, we don't need art. Well, where's your innovation gonna go? Artists can Q&A something so fast <laughs> just by playing with it that they could do the work of a lot of QA engineers in a couple of hours, you know, and they have the context and the history because art stores time. So we are in this narrow sided period of history. We also consume all of this random plastic and I'm confused why the things that we use for the least amount of time mm -hmm. are made of the most permanent material. I think it will be incredibly offensive to see a photo of someone with plastic all around them in the future. Um, it will just be considered so gauche, like having like 20 dead cats that you're like hanging out with all the time. Yeah, yeah. I've been in um, I think three or four, four years, years now, now, I've been and endeavoring not, not to purchase, purchase anything, anything new that has plastic. Has plastic. Holy moly, it, it is super, super, super hard. hard. I mean, I, mean, I, I, yeah. I, would, I would say, say I'm about 75% successful, successful, but yeah, but yeah it just yeah, drives it me crazy, crazy that, that the food that I'm going to consume tomorrow comes in, in you, know, you know, a piece of plastic, plastic that's going to be in a landfill land for yeah. 30,000 years. Or something. It's just more expensive to use plastic, or sorry, it's it's way cheaper to use plastic for food service. And if you barely make a profit, like you right, have right. to use plastic packaging. So it's not like we can be like, they need to use, it's like, well, is there, if there's a tax cut for that temporarily, or there's some sort of bonus or some sort of incentive then I think that would make it a little bit easier. And then people will be like, heck yeah, I want to be the one that they buy and they'll make some cool stuff. Well, there's a, there's a zero waste uh, packaging startup that has signed deals um, with, I 
think six or seven of the top 10 food producers. So I think there's an enormous amount of interest actually even from the big food companies to change it because, you know, Hagen dazs would love for you to get a stainless steel insulated container for your pint of delicious strawberry yogurt. It's a better deal for them. Like we used to have this with, you know, bottles of milk. It's not a new idea at all. And, and we used to I have this amazing book called how to wrap five eggs. That's, um, the Japanese means of tying your produce together and things were wrapped in banana leaves and hemp and, and it was all, it either went into the compost heap or it went back to the manu manufacturer to be refilled with the same substance. Uh, the way that we do it now is just insane. Why would you put a glass jar into a recycling bin to get crushed and melted down and made into new glass? Why wouldn't you just put more Fanta into the Fanta bottle? Yeah, it's always funny too because if Hagen Dazs sells you that stainless steel thing, now you're on a subscription to Hagen Dazs. Exactly. And you're going to go in and you're going to get it filled. So, yeah, and then suddenly it's important. But it, ah, it's also so strange because we've gotten rid of this notion that you have a long term object that you take care of really well. Like mm -hmm. the idea of an ivory cut comb. Like, you know, a woman would have these ivory cut combs that. Uh, you would pass them down for a long time and you would be devastated if you lost your comb. You know, can you imagine writing a story about somebody's devastated that they lost their shitty plastic comb? Mm -hmm. No. You know, I bought a metal comb. It's metal. It's cool. You know, like I'm going to keep it forever. And I was very upset when I lost it once because I'm like, well, it's out of print. Like it's made on a run of like a hundred from some weird store in Portland. You know, somebody got bored, made some stuff and they're like, eh, I'm done making it. See ya. Right. And I think it's really neat to have that kind of one-of-a-kind object but yeah it was like 35 dollars for a comb that i could have gotten for 60 cents at a store and you know the wealthy can buy things that are better quality for longer term and the people living paycheck to paycheck cannot afford a 130 dollar pair of leather shoes that they're going to wear for the next 10 years you know is that more eco-friendly to make something out of leather you know then we get into that kind of ethics you know complicated questions for sure yeah but anyway there's there's a lot of stuff to look at if you're interested in doing something that's beneath the surface look at material science i mean wow like there's so much cool stuff to do where there's opportunities and don't just keep making social networks uh you know yeah yeah and it's all technology i mean i think somebody listening to this might be wondering why we're talking about metal cones on a technology podcast, but I mean, in some ways it's all technology, you know, like the electricity in your wall is technology. Of course, we understand that, but you wouldn't, for example, look at the manufacturer of um, cupcakes and say, oh, this is an electric company because they use electricity in the production of your cupcakes. But we still sort of think that this is true about the internet. Like, oh, you're a tech company because you, you, you're you selling your cupcakes on the internet. It's like, we have to get past that sort of bizarre designation that, you know, you should invest in my cupcake company because I'm doing my logistics with you know, a SQL table instead of an Excel sheet, you know, it's, it's such a bizarre moment. And I hope that we're really close to people kind of catching on. I mean, I, I definitely see uh, these, these conversations about like, is Uber a tech company or a logistics company? And of course it's a transportation company. <laughs> um, it's becoming so ubiquitous. I think that we're just about there, but uh, it's, it's not, the internet that makes it interesting yeah yeah so yeah well yeah there's lots of there's lots of good things to think about i would say i it's hard for me to be positive sometimes but then i'm reminded by these institute for the future people that not only do they have a good track record of predicting the future they are positive people and i'm cool with that like <laughs> I've been negative for too long. You know, the path was to write science fiction. We also need positive science fiction. Not saccharine, sugar-based, like utopian. No. But like realistic, grounded features in which we are not just interacting with everything in the way that we expect. But, you know, let's have like more Afrofuturism, for instance. Like, let's 
let's have more cosmotechnics. Like, that's imaginary. That's cutting edge. Okay. It doesn't matter if it's realistic or not. It especially doesn't matter. But if we stop having play, then we get wrapped up into not even living life, I think. Yeah, do you have any favorite authors? Yeah, I like Paul Astaire. There's a journal called Winter Journal. He wrote in the 64th year of his life, and it's all based on his body and how it's changed over time. So um, he's, a, he's a fun author. I like to read him. And then, you know, Murakami's Second Bakery Attack. I think it was the second bakery. That's a fun one. I like snarky stuff, you know. <laughs> um, things that, oh, Mr. Penumbra's 24-hour bookstore. That's fun. Um, it's about, well, yeah, it's, it's good. Um, You're not going to tell us the plot. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't ruin it for us. Yeah, there's a short story, if you can find it online, called I Hole. What if Apple made a black hole, portable black hole? I like it already. The next model became a white hole. But anyway, what happens <laughs> when you have black holes? Well, you can attach a black hole to your lawnmower, and then all of the grass clippings go into it. Anyway, it's a great story. Look it up. I'm really a fan of short, um, unless the prose is incredible, and then I want to read, like, um, I don't know, classic works, right? Like, I like to read a lot of Russian literature. That's incredible. And um, But yeah, so some of the stuff is just like, and then reading kids' books and, like, everything that I can get my hands on. Or, like, cereal boxes, sweepstakes. Like, you know, it's really important to just... <laughs> read how things are are made like there's a narrative in that sweepstakes legalese that can inform you about let's say consent based surveillance <laughs> right <laughs> there's there's just a lot of these like little archaeological moments that you can come across and those can inform different systems and i like doing that because everyone sticks in their same lane and it's like no like, I'm not even driving I'm on the road. reading the Lucky Charms box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it's frustrating. So I just try to surround myself by, with people that play. Yeah. And, you know, all the times you played with my, at my startup, all of those became products. And, you know, I, I've been told that about early Facebook. You know, oh, we did a hackathon when we were playing. Not a hackathon where you're like, I need to win a prize and I'm really unhealthy, but, like, for fun hackathon. Yeah. And then that's where Facebook chat came out of and all these things. So I think because you're not expecting an outcome and you're not prescribing an outcome and you're just making do with what you have, you end up making more successful things. Yeah, I want to go back to what you said about uh, people with their head down. I, I take that literally. They literally have their face down into their phone. Um, and of course, we, you know, we see this all the time. Um, but how did like do you have any really practical tips for how thanks <laughs> i'll just i'll just check i'll just check look out look how distracted i mean it's so are you are you interested in um reading what you do... have on your screen right now what's that okay so the tips um look at all my notifications how many of them oh, are from yeah. humans and how many of them are from machines and Man, podcasts, like, I had to re-download it because it ate up my phone memory. So it's giving me these notifications. But I only have three apps with notifications turned on. And so I'm not dipping into my phone. My phone is completely silent. And I've actually programmed a text-based kind of Morse code type small haptic tap. You know, mostly the phone when it vibrates when you get a text is like... Right. So I made the lightest whisper of a tap. And so mm. if I'm paying attention, I might feel that there's something... But it's not a big deal. It's kind of like a butterfly. And that mm -hmm. way, I'm not going, you know, onto my face all the time. I keep it in airplane mode most of the time. And I think that's that's really nice because I'm choosing when to interact with the phone. Because no matter what, you know, a lot of people, they get on their phone, they read their email, then it stresses them out, and they're not on, on their computer, so they just don't return it, and then they lose it. So just don't read your email until you're in a space to to answer it, you know? And then maybe excuse yourself and go answer some emails and then come back when you're at dinner, you know? It's hard, and I think, you know, people in San Francisco, they love being on their phones while they're eating, it's fine, and it's considered, okay, well, we can do it. 
But you go to Spain, it's just like people are laughing. It's hilarious. Like no wonder people want to eat alone in San Francisco. Like where? What are you actually there? Right. Sometimes it's very fun, right? Like I have a lot of friends that like we're all doing silly stuff online together, and we're just happy to be in the same room. But you know, or just almost the roulette wheel or the casino type clicking on an app like Tinder where people want the perfect score, like rolling die again and again for D&D, but they'll never get it. And they just want to hoard connections. They don't want to actually act on any of them because it takes too much work and planning and their life is full, even though they have two hours a day where they Netflix binge. So, you know, it's this weird <laughs> situation. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we're just like quite out of balance right now, but we can turn off these notifications. We can turn our phone to airplane mode. We can think about these things and it's your own, you know, chance to carve the life you want and remember who you were and what you were thinking about what you were doing when you were the happiest. And remember that there's enough room in the world for everybody to be themselves. And if you, I mean, you taught me this. If you see something that somebody <laughs> is doing and you get jealous of it, you want to do the thing. Sure. Listen to that. Don't put it on the other person, you know, but like I've just noticed like, I've gotten really jealous of like a single picture. I wanted to be able to take that picture. Oh, well then I'll just go and get good. You know, it's my responsibility. I'm the one with the, er, you know, and, and early on I wanted to make a startup too, you know, and that was, so I made one. I, so I think there's lots of things to do, but you have to be able to process things differently than like everybody tells you to and try to make your own life and know that, you know, on a 50 year timeline, nothing is normal. And when people are like, you need to have a kid at this age, and da 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 da, it's like, well, you guys are fearful. Like, maybe that's what you wanted to do with your life, but um, there's plenty of other things to do. Do it for your own self. You know, don't do it because it comes from a need to satisfy someone else's expectation of you. And I think that um, I definitely resonate what you're saying. And I think that getting your head out of your phone, I've done a lot of very similar things. I have text notifications. All of my notifications are completely off. Uh, and I've told everybody, like, I, you have to make a little bit of social, you have to have like one or two conversations to actually adjust the expectations if you're doing something that's outside of the norm. But it's something that you can just negotiate. And I do this with everybody that I um, that I work with and that would need to get a hold of me immediately. I'm like, look, I don't have any text notifications on. If you ever need me urgently, just call me on my phone because my ringer is on and nobody almost ever calls me. And when they do, it's like people I want to talk to. <laughs> um, so those little tweaks, it, it feels like people think that it's not possible like it what you turned off text notifications you're in 2019 are you dead <laughs> no actually my life's great it's so much better without that and i also don't have notifications um i'm on iphone so i've got all a whole bunch of stuff doesn't turn on until noon so i don't see and i also don't have badges on almost anything i do have badges on on notification but that's it no phone no peeking down from the top, uh, no banners, no lock screen, nothing. The only thing, the only way that I know I, I have text messages is there's a badge, but it's fine. I see it. I don't really, no one has ever been like, oh my gosh, you didn't get my message. You didn't see it in time. Unless it's like those rare cases of, you know, we're needing each other for dinner or something and they need to get a hold of me imminently. And that works just fine with phone calls. So there's, there's been a couple of moments where I've missed urgent things, but since telling people that they can just call me on the phone, that like, it's fine. And my attention is just, I'm in a completely different place. It's what you lose by being hijacked all the time is knowing who you are, knowing what you want. <laughs> just that, just the small stuff. Yeah, and it's like knowing who you are and what you want are considered soft things that we shouldn't have. It's like, what? <laughs> like, yeah. I think a lot of people like having kids because they get to relive their childhood again. You know, they get to go to all the silly parks and be silly and play yeah. peekaboo. And it's this relief. It's a beautiful thing. This, this sleep deprived relief. <laughs> but yeah, so, but, but I think, yeah, but like fundamentally, we should have the freedom to participate in the world we want to participate in, like in the way that we want, which is, especially mm -hmm. in the United States, you get a bunch of different states, they're different 
you know, um, and around the world, like we have to just remember that no matter what we're experiencing, that is not normal at all. There's no norm and we just have to trust or just narrow the group of people that we hang out with mm -hmm. so that we have really deep connections. Um, you know, I would say that four years ago, five years ago, if I were to go in the hospital, I wouldn't know anybody that would care enough to come by. Right. You know, I think my boyfriend would have out of obligation, <laughs> but he wouldn't have enjoyed it, you know. And, and I think I was lying to myself in that I needed to remove all of my aesthetics so that I could do tech better. It was right. only when I realized that the startup that became successful became successful because it came out of an art project. Mm -hmm. And all these like random art slash technology events. That's when I was like, oh, trying to start a company deliberately to make X, Y, and Z might result in some short term thing. Which is fine to do if you come from a different social class and you need to accelerate your social class forward by the riskiest way possible and almost mm -hmm. 100% failure. That's great. But like, you know, if, if, if you think about what people really need or like what you built on the way to building the startup, like that's probably more useful. <laughs> you know, somebody still yeah, needs to... As someone who did the... Let's take the, let's buy the lottery ticket. I just want you to know that lottery ticket cost me about $200,000. And I'm not sad that I did it, but that there was a lot of things that I could have done with $200,000 uh, of my own money, plus the 500,000 of other people's money that I spent um, starting a company. And, and it left me in, in a state of depression that I had never known. I didn't know that you could get that tired. I didn't know. It's not a joke. <laughs> so as, a, as much as I feel like I'm fundamentally an entrepreneur and will absolutely start another company, um, cause that's just an aspect of my personality that, that needs an outlet and I love creating things in the world. I will never do it through that means again. Uh, because I jerk my head out of my phone and, and know what I am know what I am, know who I am, know what I want in the world. And I feel like I can't ever, I can't ever go back to, um, it's interesting. I was going to say, I can't, I don't want to be without technology entirely, but that's not the choice. It's I am using the technology as a tool instead of having it using me. And I think that's the difference. And that's maybe the essence of even what comp technology is to bring it all the way back to where we started. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, well, as we are wrapping up here, we covered so much. Is there anything that you would want to add? Um, yeah, consider what you're doing with your life. <laughs> Just that. <laughs> and it's okay if you have wasted 10 or 20 years because it's never too late. And when you take a leap, take it calculated, like do your thing on the side while you're doing the main thing until it gets enough, or just have a hobby and remember what a hobby was. You don't have to be the perfect person. Don't be the best person on the web. It's something that gives you joy that's not for others. Or you help other people out and then that's super fun. And then, yeah, it's just not these like, super individualized things, even though it seems like it. And actually to do things with others and have fun, you have to hang out with them and play. Mm -hmm. So to do that, you have to become, you can't direct, you can't dictate, you can't just follow. You're playing, it always switches around. Beautiful. All right, uh, last question. What's your favorite hack? Favorite hack. Oh, this is not a very positive hack, but when I, I, have, I have a thing where I really enjoy smoking cigarettes and so did everybody in my family. But I heard from a Quantified Self Conference that if you just wait five minutes and get yourself distracted, you won't necessarily need to smoke. And I have also remembered what it feels like after I smoke and it doesn't feel very good. 
So whenever I think about smoking, I just think about the bad feeling instead. Mm. It's a pretty useful hack. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Amber Case, for coming on Hacker Noon. Yeah, thank you. That was Amber Case. Check out links to her books, Calm Technology and Designing with Sound, plus all the resources she mentioned in the show notes. Please don't forget to subscribe to the Hacker Noon podcast on iTunes or head on over to YouTube if you want to see our smiling faces. You can also find us at hackernoon.com and podcast.hackernoon.com or on Twitter at, you guessed it, Hacker Noon. I'm Chris Beasley. See you next Tuesday for another episode of the Hacker Noon podcast. Mm-hmm.